So good evening, I'm Beth Billings and I'm from Around the Table Yarns and we're going to be doing the July hat tonight as part of our Project Monday. Tonight is February 10th, or February, January 10th. I can't remember what date it is. And the July hat is a pattern from, there really is too much light in here, um, from the Kelburn Woolens Year of Hats. This is a pattern that came out in 2019. They brought out 12 patterns in 2019 because it was a year of hats. And we tried to do it in 2020 as a knit along or as a monthly knit along. And what we learned was that not every hat was created equally. And some of the hats had much more complicated beginnings and middles and ends. And so we rearranged the order of the, of the year so that we could do the July hat first. Um, and that is because this hat, except for some chart reading um, or some stitch work is quite straightforward and simple to do um, and has all of the basics of hat making if you've never made a hat before, if you've never successfully gotten a hat to fit before, this hat is a pretty good one. And actually we found that most of the hats from the 12 different patterns are good ones for um, making. It calls for worsted weight yarn. And I have the yarn here that we have on sale today. So this just happens to be uh, January 10th and we are running a 20% off sale on the Germantown yarn from Kelburn Woolens today and that goes to midnight. So if you're interested in doing the year of hats and you wanna get, you wanna stock up a little bit, um, today's a good day to do it. If you get four of them, it's like you get the fifth one free. And getting out my tools. When I did the hat, so here's my hat. Look, it's just like the picture. <laughs> um, when I did my hat, I, I was able to block it and um, it is a little bit smaller than the measurements here, but I found that it fit me just fine. So I can, I can turn the video back around and put it on. little clippies in my hair but it fits just fine and I would say even with all my lots of curly hair this is a good size so um, their hat they say is eight and three quarters inches tall and um, 18 inches around 18 and a half inches around unstretched and mine is only eight inches tall from top to bottom and it was about eight inches wide too when I measured it. So when I measured across here, it was only eight inches across. And when I measured it from top to bottom, it was only eight inches tall. So I think it's a pretty versatile, um, good hat pattern and it should fit most people. Um, we had somebody with a big head try it on today too. So that was helpful. The pattern is free. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you see it. You can download it from the Kelburn Woolen site, I believe, or from Ravelry. So I'm just going to go down and talk about some of the information in the pattern. Um, I'm going to make it just a little darker in here so that there's a little more contrast. a little bit better, I think. Let's see if I can focus just a little bit. There we go. That's a little bit darker. Still kind of hard to read. Let me see if I can focus it a little bit better. I'm sorry, that doesn't seem to want to focus too well. 
there. Oh, that's much better. Can everybody read that better? Yep, okay, good. All right, so um, let's just go through a little bit of information before we get started. I'm gonna try and demonstrate the, the salient, the, the important parts of this hack today so that you have a recording of the, the things that I think might be tough. Um, but before we get started, the yarn is again, the Kelburn Woolens Germantown and the color is baby pink um, and they call for one skein. They're looking for a gauge of 18 stitches and 24 rows to four inches in the triangle stitch. The triangle stitch is this knit and purl pattern that's essentially stockinette and um, reverse stockinette. So if you um, do it in stockinette, that should be okay. If you do your gauge swatch in stockinette, that should be okay. Sorry, I'm closing the door because now everybody is at home and having conversations loudly. Okay, at least they're not barking. The tools that are called for for this hat are a set of double pointed needles and two different sizes of 16 inch needles, a size eight and a size seven. And the size eight is the, the size, the larger size for the body of the hat. Many hats, if you haven't done a hat before, many hat ribbings are done on smaller needles. So that's this part of the hat here. The ribbing is the beginning of the hat and they're often done on smaller needles because um, it will stay on your head better. And so you often will find that hat patterns call for two different sizes. And that is the case for, I think, all or all but one of the patterns that we'll be doing this year. Um, the range of sizes for the body of the hat for most of them is between size six, seven, and eight. So having a size eight needle or having size eight double points um, is certainly worthwhile. Although for the double points, most of the patterns, the double points are a size seven going forward. And so they're size seven going forward. So if you did all of your finishing with double points on a size seven, I promise not to tell the knitting police and I don't think there's a reason why that's a problem. So um, go ahead and if you wanna only get one pair or one set of double pointed needles, make them a size seven because almost all of them are in a size seven and it won't make a big difference for the ones that, are, that use a size six or a size eight. Uh, just like to save you a little money on purchasing. Um, they tell you in the pattern, the skills that you need are knitting, purling, and decreases. So that's awesome. It's worked in the round from the bottom of the hat up. After we do the ribbed brim, we will increase four stitches. And then we will do this large graphic triangle pattern with integrated decreases shaping the crown and both the charted and written instructions are provided. And I'm gonna show you and talk, review with you how to read a chart um, since they so nicely give us both. And this is a great opportunity. If you're not a chart reader, if you don't normally use a chart, this pattern is a great way to become more familiar. So um, it is a free pattern and they have a website with abbreviations. So if there are abbreviations that you don't know, you can go to the website. The stitch patterns that they give are, this, are the ribbing, knit two, purl two, and it is the same all the way around. Here it is, knit two, purl two, repeat from the asterisk around, repeat round one for the pattern. In other words, we'll cast on a multiple of four stitches. We're actually gonna cast on 80 stitches. We're gonna knit two, purl two around, place a marker, continue working in the round on knit two, purl two, so it, it lines up and makes these lovely ribs. And then when it's done, when we've done two inches of it, we'll be done with our ribbing. And then we'll go on to the triangle stitch. Now this is just a listing of it. It's not the pattern itself. The pattern itself is on the next page three, and it starts at the top in the directions with the brim. 
So using smaller needles, cast on 80 stitches and join for working in the round. As you can see, I started this this morning and I cast on all but 80 stitches. And the reason I did that is I wanted to demonstrate the, um, I want, oh, my hands are a mess. It's nice and cold out. I wanted to demonstrate the old Norwegian or German twisted cast on. So here we are, and I have 70 stitches already on my size seven needle. It's a 16 inch needle, and my goal is for these stitches to stretch from tip to tip. So the reason we use a size 16 needle is because in the round, you want the, there to be no gap between any of the stitches. Um, the, the needle itself, the stitches should either be crowded on the needle or just fit on the needle. There shouldn't be fewer stitches than the length of the needle. Okay, there should be the same or more stitches. So I'm casting on and I'm using a one-handed cast on called the German Twisted or the Old Norwegian. And it, I want to get that out of the way, Let's see if I can wrap it around my hand. Okay, so can everybody see? I have picked up the two strands. The working yarn is the yarn attached to the ball and the, the tail. I currently have the tail over my thumb. I cannot currently remember if that's the place it's supposed to be, but I made it a really long tail. So I have plenty of it here for my last 10 stitches. So I'm not worried about running out. Okay, so I have the two strands coming from the needle. I start this typically by just wrapping the yarn in my fingers and twisting it around my needle like that. That's where I start. And then I make the, the motions for my German twisted cast on. So I've already done that. If you choose, you can also do a slip knot to start. It's all slippy. Okay, so then I open, I grab both strands with one finger and I open with my thumb and my forefinger so that one strand comes over my thumb, right around my nail, and one strand comes over my forefinger. So it makes a V. There's a loop on my thumb. So for the old German, sorry, the German twisted or the old Norwegian cast on, I take my needle point under and down my thumb over the strand that's on my pointer finger. And then there's a triangle here at the base. You can just sort of see a triangle just at the base there. I can bring my needle through it, or I, it's a little hard to bring your needle through it when you have all of these stitches on already. I like to bend my thumb and bring the needle through. A lot of people let go with their left hand now, and I don't. I do move my right hand up, so in a motion up away from my thumb, and then I'll take my thumb out of the loop and pull down on that strand. I'm gonna show it to you again, that's one stitch. So I've gotten back in the V position, I go under the loop on my thumb, and then come down my thumb through it under and through, then over the strand. So over the strand on my pointer. And then there's this triangle. I could come through the triangle, but I find it's easier if I just bend my thumb. And then I lift up and pull down on the stitch. What that does is it creates an extra little bump of the stitch. I wonder if I'm doing this backwards from where I started. Hmm. It looks like my bumps are on the other side from where I started. 
wonder if I, I'm holding it backwards or if I just twisted my yarns around. Hmm. Things you notice. <laughs> so under and through, over and through, and then lift up. Nope, that looks right. Under both and through, over and back through the loop on your thumb and up. Under and through. So from the top, I'm doing that, rotating it over that one strand, and then I'm rotating through the loop on my thumb. Come in and I'll watch you do it and help you. And we want to have 10 more stitches. Just going to do it a little faster so we can get there. We'll count three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 33. 9, 42, 45, 48, 51, 7, 60, 3, 6, 9, 72, 75. Oh, 80. I did it. So proud. I'm going to get some markers out because I'm going to join it in the round and do my first round of ribbing. So I'm going to get out my little set of markers. Okay, now if you have not joined something in the round before, what you need to know is that your working yarn should be on the right hand side. Do not join with your tail. If you feel tempted to do that, break your tail so it's shorter so you know you're not knitting with it. So I just broke my tail and here's my working yarn. So make sure you're using your working yarn when you start this. You can put a marker here and I would like to use something that's not pink, not <laughs> black, how about gray? So I'm gonna put a marker there. I've got my working yarn in my hand. I'm throwing my yarn to the floor where hopefully no cats or dogs will eat it. And so now I want to join it in the round. The next thing you need to do, so you have the yarn on the right-hand side ready to be worked. Now, even if you're a continental knitter, the yarn should be attached to the last stitch that you cast on. The first stitch that you cast on is the next one in the, the hat. So we have 80 stitches cast on, and I'm looking very carefully while they're laying here on the table, and I'm making sure that they are not spinning around the needles. You see that I followed the edge, the cast on edge all the way around and it's not spun around anywhere on the needles. So I know that it is not twisted on the needles so I can go ahead and join. So I'm just gonna put my right needle directly in to the first stitch that I cast on I'm going to make sure that I have my working yarn and not my tail. I'm going to firmly knit that first stitch. Now, some people do an extra one and they do a little pass one stitch over the other one. I don't do that. I don't bother with that. And the reason is that if I have a little bit of looseness at the beginning, I would rather when I weave in my tail, I would rather use the tail to take care of that looseness. Also, if you really struggle with not getting it twisted on the needle, you could work the first two or three or four rows of the, of the hat, the four, one, two, three. on the fourth row or, or an even number row, you would wanna join it. And the reason is, that if you have a little bit of knitting, it's easier to keep it from twisting. So 
that would be um, an alternative to joining it in the round on the first round. You could join it on the fourth round instead. But here I am, I'm joined. And what I want you to pay attention, it looks pretty close together here, but when I get all the way around, there may have been some stretching in that one strand that's connecting my last stitch to my first stitch, and that's okay. What I have found is that stretching does not remain. And in fact, when you look at the beginning of my hat, and it's very easy now I figured out how to tell where the beginning of my hat is, it's right here. So here's the, the very beginning of my hat, my knit two. So there's this little divot, that's it. It's kind of hard to see. And it's hard to see where I wove it in on the other side. But that's the beginning. And the reason I know that is because that's, this is where the pattern changes up above. So I know that that's the beginning of my round. So I'm pretty pleased with how that looks. And I didn't do any uh, knitting an extra stitch or casting on an extra stitch. I think when you're trying to count your stitches, it's just easier to count the stitches and not worry about whether you have one extra or not. So I'm gonna knit one, purl two around, and then we're gonna do the next step in the pattern, which is the increase round. So does anybody have any questions at this point? While I do my 80 stitches, please talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Is there anybody who's doing this who's a brand new hat knitter? Not a brand new hat knitter, but is that German twisted cast on the preferred or is that just something new? It's for, for a stretchy cast on. Um, I like okay. it a lot and I um, often use it for my socks and my hats and my okay. cuffs and my hems. And the reason is that it has an extra little, if you go to the stitches that I cast on, it has an extra little bump mm -hmm. here of yarn. And okay. that gives it a little bit of durability and um, elasticity. It's durable, okay. it lasts well, and it also stretches and comes back pretty well. It doesn't stretch out and stay stretched out. So I like that cast on. My second favorite is the long tail cast on. And for durability after that, I kind of like the cabled cast on, which is a simpler one that doesn't need um, a long tail. Does anybody use a different cast on than those? I use the long tail cast on. I've never done the German twist. Okay. So this, the, um, on the video is the German twisted. And there are other videos out there. I particularly like very, I think it's very pink knits. Um, and Andrea Mowry also has a German twisted. I have some uh, links to other videos I can put up on the website for the future. It's a good thing to practice because um, it's not easy to do, but once you've learned it, I think you'll like it. And it becomes very quick to do once, once you're comfortable and you've kind of memorized doing it, it becomes very, um, uh, I, I think you would like it as much as I do because it, it makes such a pretty edge and it's, it wears so nicely. Now I'm coming up on my beginning of round. So I placed a marker for the beginning of round, which the directions tell you to do. And remember I said that it starts to stretch out while you're knitting. And that is exactly what's happened. So if that bothers you, again, you could work a few rounds or a few rows back and forth in pattern. 
and then sew a little tiny seam at the beginning. I'm getting here. So here we come to the end of our round. Hopefully I didn't flub and knit three or knit one. Oh, I didn't. That's, am that's amazing. <laughs> So I'm going to purl two at the end and notice how weak that looks. That's okay. Move the yarn to the back, slip your marker, knit the next one. By putting your needle in there, you're taking up some of that slack already. See that? And so continuing in this pattern, you will, you will use up some of that slack. You can also pull a little bit on the tail will help and then we can use the tail to close any further gap that there is. So now let's look at the pattern again. It said place the marker indicating the beginning of the round and work in knit two purl two ribbing for two inches or five centimeters. Sometimes I wish we were working in centimeters. They're so much easier. Then it tells us in the next round, so you've done two inches. I'm going to show you things without having done all the work because I already did the work here. So we're going to skip to the last round of the ribbing. I'm going to pretend that this is the last round of the ribbing. Um, I counted earlier and there were 13, I think. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So if you do 12 rounds of the ribbing and then this increase round could be round 13. So it tells you work in pattern for 20 stitches, make one and then repeat that. If you have 80 stitches and you're working for 20 and making one and repeating, you can only do that four times. So we started with 80 stitches and we end up with 84. So it's just four stitches added. So let's go ahead and do that. So knit two, purl two. It doesn't tell us to knit um, this round. It tells us to work in pattern. Twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 19. You have a choice. So here's the 20th stitch. I could purl into the front and then knit into the back of that stitch like a knit front and back. That would give me two stitches in the 20th stitch. So it would give me one stitch between the 20th stitch and the 21st, sti 21st stitch. That's one option. I could purl my 20th stitch and simply pick up a strand between and work into that strand. So I usually transfer it to my other needle and then I work it as a twist. So I could purl it as a twist or I could go in the other way. I like to pull this forward so it's easy for me to get into it and knit it as a twist. So that's a make one. It's actually a make one right. And then I could continue with the pattern. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Which one do you want to see again? The make one or the knit front and back? Anybody? Which do you usually use? Make make one. That I have a hard time with it. <laughs> okay. 17, 18, 19. I usually use the knit front and back. 
So I would do a knit front and back or a purl front and back into the 20th stitch because if I do it, it's always going to be on the left side of the last stitch that I worked or of the stitch. So I'm doing it into a stitch. But if I'm making one, I'm looking for the strand of yarn between the two stitches. So this is the strand of yarn. I would come from behind. So I would take my left needle and go under that strand from behind. I would move my yarn to the back. I find it difficult to get into that. I think everybody does. So to make it easier, I go into it the way that's easiest, which is purl wise into that strand. And I pull it with my finger. I pull the needle and I put another finger behind so it's left loose. And then it's really easy to get in there and knit it. And then you see there's that twist. I've knitted into the twisted strand. So that's two of my increases. One, two. Okay, so here I am again, I'm on the 20th stitch. I'm just gonna show you the, um, the purl into the front and the back. So this is a normal purl. I've put my right needle into the front leg of that stitch and I purl normally. And then I usually knit it because I'm in ribbing and I'm changing right there. And so I add a knitted stitch. But what happens really is that the top of the stitch comes across and creates a bar at the bottom. So it actually kind of looks like another purl. So you could knit it or purl it, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I like to have moved my yarn because now I'm ready for my last set of uh, stitches that begin with a knit stitch. So notice I'm doing all the different ways across this piece. It doesn't really matter because your increases are being hidden they're being sort of tucked into the ribbing. And because of that, they won't show very, um, they won't be very definite or, or very obvious in the hat, even in this nice light color. Okay. So I'm gonna make one more. And the last one is going to be at the very end before the beginning of round marker. So here's 19 and 20, and there's my loose strand. So I come behind. If I can knit into it easily, that's wonderful. But if I can't, again, I put my right needle into it and pull it forward towards me and put my pointer finger behind it. That leaves me a nice loose strand. Can you see how nice and loose that is? And I can just rotate my point of my right needle into it and make the stitch easily. So that's how you do the increase section at the beginning of, or at the end of the ribbing. Okay, now it tells you to change to bigger needles. So here are my set of bigger needles. I'm working on the sevens. I've done my ribbing now, all of it in the size seven and I'm going to work one more stitch. I'm gonna work the first stitch. Oh, that's my tail. Uh, with this, so I don't lose my marker. So I'm just working one more stitch or you could use, you could stop one stitch before the end, but this is so that my marker doesn't fall off of the end of my short circular needle. So that is now, I've changed to larger needles and I'm gonna begin the triangle stitch immediately. So that one stitch is all I get in knit because 
the triangle stitch is on a different page. The triangle stitch is, oh, sorry, it's purl 13. So I should have purled it. See, I'm already wrong. Okay, so I'm gonna purl that one stitch and then I'm gonna change needles. So I purled one after the marker and I'm changing needles. And my pattern is rounds one and two. It says purl 13, knit one, and repeat from the asterisk around. Where you see the semicolon, place a marker. So I'm gonna place markers that are a different color than the one that I'm using. So I'm spilling out my marker thing so I can have different color markers. And I'm gonna go ahead and continue so I'm gonna stick my bigger needle in between these two. And then I'm gonna pull this so it's out of my way. Sometimes I tuck it into the knitting so it doesn't come back and get in my way. Remember to count the stitch that's there after the marker. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and then it says to knit one, knit one. And now I'm gonna place a different colored marker. I'm gonna put a black marker on. And now I'm gonna resume purl 13 and place a marker. So you guys all have access to your calculators out there. If there's 14 stitches, how many repeats of this pattern will I have? There's 14 stitches in the repeat. Six. Exactly. And you can see that. Thank you. 11, 12, 13, and one. Just putting these great big markers in here for fun. So I'm going to go all the way around. And the reason you do this is because you don't want to do what I did, which is make the hat without markers in it. I thought because it was a visual pattern, I thought because it was such a visual pattern, can you all see the pearls and the knit stitches clearly enough? Yep. Yep. Okay. So you can see I'm here. At the beginning, so here you can see there's a little divot where um, this is where the pattern changes. So this is the beginning of my round is right here on this purl. So purl 13 and then knit one and then purl 13 and knit one. And you've got essentially three triangles to a side when you do that. And then we're gonna do that for two rounds. So that helps build up the height, this nice equilateral looking triangle. It builds up the height is it possible to hide the jog? Yes. You could hide the jog by starting with this part of the pattern, but then that screws up the decreases up above. Um, you could potentially just start the, the purling in the last, so instead of knitting across these stitches in the last part of the round, I have to look at what round number that is. I can't, I can't do that right now, just, okay. So it's rounds 15 and 16 where it changes to purl six. So you could, instead of ending with a knit seven, you could end with a knit one purl six. Is that right? 
you'd purl one and then you would just, I think you would just purl and then all of these stitches would be purled here. After the knit one, you would purl the rest of them. That would, that would probably be the best hiding of that jog. Is that a good answer? Yeah, I, I was thinking more of like what you do with Fair Isle when you're trying to hide your color changes. If yeah, it's not the same as a color change though. Okay, that's, that's why I asked. That makes sense. Okay, I'm knitting furiously back in the background. <laughs> Fourteen. So I want to show you. So here's the pattern. Here's the knitted part. Right. And what I want you to see in the knitted part is this makes total like the pattern makes total sense. Purl 13, knit one. Purl 13, knit one. In row three, knit one. Purl 11, knit two knit one, purl 11, knit two, knit two, purl nine, knit three, and so on. So each of these equilateral stockinette triangles are growing every two rows, and the reverse stockinette equilateral triangles are shrinking every two rows, and you're starting here so eventually you'll have knit stitches at the beginning of the round since this is this right here is the line of the beginning of the round. Okay, so if you're placing markers, you're placing them here at the beginning. This is this would be a marker and over here would be a marker. And so as you go up, eventually we switch to the purl stitch and a knit and a purl, and it makes the it makes it jogs the triangles over so that they're lined up with each other. Does that make sense? So if you look at the pattern written out, can you see where that jog happens easily? And I think the answer is no, you can't really see easily. You'd have to read carefully to see that it happens in rounds 15 and 16. But if you just looked at it, you'd actually have to read what's going on to know exactly where that happens. However, if you're doing the chart, and this is why I'm such a big proponent of charts, unless you've lost them, oh, here it is. If you look at the chart, it looks like the hat. Does that make sense? So if I've put a marker where the line is, and I've put another marker after every 14 stitches where the other line is, then when I'm looking down at my row or at my round, I just have to follow these stitches to figure out where I am. I'm between the marker. There's 14 stitches between the marker. And I can just count how many purl stitches or knit stitches at the beginning to figure out which row I'm in. And I can compare it. Like if I'm, if I'm looking at my work and I'm already past this point, then I can look very quickly and figure out which row in here it's going to be because I'm already past the, the changing point. But here you can't, in the, in the triangle part of the pattern, you can't see that so easily. That's why I like charts. So to read a chart like this, what you want to pay attention to is where the numbers are. When you're working in the round, the numbers are always on the right-hand side. They're always gonna go up the right-hand side. And in fact, for this pattern, there are 28 rounds total until we get to the decreases. So you've got two inches of the ribbing and then 28 rounds of this pattern 
and then we're going to be actually starting the decreases. Does anybody have any questions about the chart? I'm still finishing my round, putting markers in. Has anybody not used a, mar a chart before? I haven't used a chart before. Okay. How do you feel about it looking at the chart and the project? It looks all right, because sometimes I'll, um, I'll write little numbers. So I guess I make up my own chart. <laughs> but right. little numbers to show where I'm where I'm supposed to be at. My husband always say, Why are you writing that out again? I said, it helps me to follow. And then I check it off as I do each line. So one of the things with a chart is that it can be a little bit small. And you can blow this up. And some okay. people use um some people use their printers or they use, if they have a, a tablet device, they can use their tablet device to blow it up. Okay. So, cause, cause you can enlarge what the screen shows you yes. if it makes it easier to see, or you can do what I do and wear magnifying glasses. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Four, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, Okay, I'm coming to the end of my round, 12, 13. Oh, I did it perfectly. I'm, I'm shooting only baskets today. Okay, so I come to the end. So this is still joining the two different needles or, or changing needles. So I'm going to do my last knit stitch of the pattern. And then I'm going to actually leave it there because the next round I knit that first stitch. No, sorry, I purl that first stitch because this is round two. And now my smaller needle is completely free. I just knitted off the stitches onto the larger sized needle. So that's how you can, that's one way to switch. And now if you can see, I've put markers all the way around my knitting. They're in black and silver and my beginning of round marker is the white one. So then I would just continue in my pattern following each round and making sure that the 14 stitches between the, the markers were correct and making note when I get to the white marker that I have now changed to the next round. So now we're going to go to the decrease chart and I'm going to demonstrate the decreases. And that's gonna be our whole lesson. So here's the decrease chart and it's Chance who's asking this question, um, what does the S2KP mean? So let me just point out a couple of things about charts when the number of stitches changes and then I'll demonstrate both of these decreases. So the really wonderful thing about this hat pattern is that it has a beautiful star-shaped top. You see that? So these are the sections of purl stitch that you begin with and they make a little triangle and then you continue with the decreases with the, um, the patterning between the stockinette and the reverse stockinette. And it makes this beautiful snowflake sort of um, star on the top of the hat. So I, I was really delighted with this pattern. I thought that it was a very elegant crown and a very simple one to work. So what happens is you get to the end of row 28. And at row 28, it has completely reversed. You knit 13 and purl one, all the way around. And then you're done with the, the triangle stitch chart and you move immediately to the decrease stitch chart. When you move to the decrease stitch chart, at some point, you may need to move to double pointed needles. So I'm gonna demonstrate that too. And uh, first I'm gonna do a round of the decrease. So I've just done round one here 
and I'm going to pretend that it's round one of the decrease chart and move right into the decrease chart for you guys. So what you see is a blank space at the beginning of round two, and that's exactly what it is. A blank space is no stitch. There is no stitch there. And what's happening here, the slanted A looking creature, that is a double decrease. So this stitch and this stitch are gone and they're here in this one stitch. So you ignore that. When you get to round two, you read from where the, the printed um, chart begins. So this is, this is the beginning, this is the first stitch after the marker, okay? So that may seem a little bit, bit confusing, but it's really very straightforward. There is no stitch here, okay? And the reason it lines up like this is because they're showing you how it will end up looking, not how the chart would accurately be read. So the chart would accurately be read with this stitch sitting on top of this stitch, but this is what it looks like in real life. So I've already knit that first stitch and you can just count over one, two, three, four, five. So there's five pearls, two, three, four, five. And then there's a pearl three together. So I very simply put my right needle into all three stitches on the edge of the left needle. One, two, three, wrap it around and bring it through. That is essentially a centered double decrease on the purl side. It doesn't look like it's leaning one way or the other. It looks like it's centered on that stitch. And then I one, two, three, four, five, and one. So I complete the remainder of that section, just like lining up exactly. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, and the last one. So I'm going to continue doing that all the way around. One, two. So there's a little bit of counting. And what I've found is that if I don't keep track of this counting, here's my double decrease, I get lost and I screw up. It's not a lot of knitting here. The stitches are decreasing every other round by two stitches per section. So you're decreasing from 84 stitches down by 12 stitches each round. It's pretty fast decreasing. So just like if you have a short row section in a sweater um, or a hat or anything, and, I, and you ask me about it, I will tell you, I think you should just shut up and knit. Don't talk to somebody, don't watch the TV, don't teach a class. <laughs> just do one, two, three, four, five, check your counts, make sure you're accurate, Try not to be distracted when you're doing those decreased rows because it's easier if you it, it will take less time and you'll be done with the project sooner. So I don't know if you're noticing, but it is starting to decrease around as I go. I'm going to switch on the next round and then I'm going to show you the um, SK2Ps and that's the last thing we're going to do. Has anybody not worked with double pointed needles? I've not worked with them very successfully. Okay. <laughs> so um, Chance, is it Chance? I'm, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, asked what the, in the decrease chart, what does S2KP mean? And what it means is slip two stitches knit wise. And I'll show you what that means. And then you knit the following stitch. And then you pass the two slipped stitches back over the one stitch that you just knit. Okay, 
coming around to the end here. Yep. So let's, let's switch to our double pointed needles and then we'll do Two, three. So I find the markers are really helpful because I can look down and I can see, okay, I've got just three more of these to do. And then I can feel the marker behind my thumb and that tells me I've got one last stitch to do. Okay, now my tail is here. Now it would be eight inches away if I were at the very top of my hat, but I just want to demonstrate what it means to, to change to your double pointed needles. So I chose short ones because I was in the short needle bin. I could have chosen longer ones. Speaking to me. Um, and it just depends on how many needles you're gonna use around. So I have a total of five needles in my set and I'm going to work with four and, and or I'm gonna set four in there and I'm gonna use a fifth one to knit off of. So at this point, um, that's gonna be between my sections. So what I might do is put a section and a half on a couple of my, or on three of my needles or several of my needles. I'm gonna remove the markers as I go um, that would be between the needles. So if this is, this is where my white marker was, so I'm not gonna keep the white marker that tells me it's the beginning of the round. So I use my tail to tell me if I'm at the beginning of the round and I try and pay attention to see if I've done the beginning of the round. Um, another way that you could do it is to take a safety pin and pin it into that section or pin it between stitches, but you could pin it where you can see it easily into the first section after the beginning of the round. So that's another way of marking what you're doing. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna pretend that I'm going to do the center double decreases on this round and I'm gonna knit, but just to show you how you change, it's just like we did with the second needle, when we changed from the smaller needle to the bigger needle, you just stick the new needle in. Here's my new double pointed needle, and I'm just going to stick it in, and I'm going to work my stitches onto it. And when I get to the center, I don't need to get to the center, but when I get to the center and I'm ready to do this SK2P, what I'm going to do I want it to be crystal clear. I'm going to slip my stitches two at a time knitwise. So I take the tip of my needle and I move it to the left side of the second stitch on the left hand needle. So I'm in between the second and the third stitch and I move into both of those stitches and I just bring them off of the needle. I knit the next stitch. So now I have three stitches that have been worked. I take the tip of my left needle and I go into the base of those two slipped stitches only. And again, I pull those stitches forward to make it easier to pass them over the worked stitch. My working yarn is attached to that stitch, so that's another way of sort of anchoring it. But if you pull it to the side so that you can see the stitch, it becomes easier to bring just that stitch through and you can drop the two stretched out stitches. When you work them back down, what you see is that they are that that decrease is centered on the stitch itself. I'm going to show you what it would look like if I there's another decrease that leans and that's where you knit two together. Sorry, you slip one, knit two together. 
and you pass the slip stitch over. And this one leans ever so slightly from right to left. So it is a leaning or um, an angled decrease. This one, it's looking a little bit wonky because it's got that purl three together. But this one, if you pull it down, these stitches are actually lined up underneath the middle stitch. And that's why it looks like a centered double decrease. So those centered double decreases in the hat look like this. You see them here? So there's only a couple of them, but they make this chain of stitches that goes into the very top. Can everybody see that okay? I'm just looking at Jennifer. She's the one whose face I can see. So she's nodding. I'm going to assume you can all see it. But do you notice here how small the circumference is that you're going around? So that is, it really is not a lot of knitting left at that point. Okay, so the centered double decrease, the SK2P, if you want to write a note, it is slip two stitches knit wise, knit the next stitch, and pass the slipped two stitches back over the knitted stitch. And it is also called a central, centered double decrease because it looks like they're coming into the center underneath this sort of chain of stitches. And those purl three togethers are less noticeable, but I sort of felt like this was kind of perfect for Christmas time because it looked to me a little bit like a Christmas tree with a star on top. <laughs> and that's the July hat. Any questions? Finding my mouse. My mouse got hidden. How was that, everybody? Good, thank you. You're very welcome. It was fine. I guess I'm ready to start it. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I got a thumbs up. It's easier me. than the January hat. Oh my God, the January hat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we started, we, I, I said this earlier, we started the January hat in January, the first year after, the first January after we opened. And then we had a pandemic, which gave us an excuse not to do it anymore. <laughs> But it was like, oh my God, <laughs> we don't need to start there. And that's part of the reason they're starting a whole new year of hats this year. And it's the year of chunky hats or your bulky hats. And we're not going to do the year of hats with the bulkies until we've seen all the patterns and we can put them in the correct order so that you can learn hat making from the beginning. So there are other ways to make ribbings. There are other ways to cast on. There are other ways to um, embellish a hat. And we're going to learn all about them in the other 11 hats. And I think you'll find that this is really a fun hat to do. It looks great with a pom-pom. And you will have plenty of yarn left over if you want to make a pom-pom with the pink. Um, but otherwise, it also looks good as just a plain hat. The end. Any questions? I like to see smiling faces. That's so nice. I've made a huge mess on my, like, like everything in my life isn't a huge mess, but I've made a huge mess on my desk. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a little bit after seven. Hi, Brenda. Oh, Brenda, you're, you're muted. You're still muted. You have to hit your microphone. Here we go. There you go. Say it again. I was eating when we first started. So. <laughs> I'm drinking now. Uh oh. <laughs> so when I get off, it has to convert to video. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes for it to do that. And then I will take that and I will post it to YouTube, which is how we make the link that goes onto our site. So it takes about an hour total for me to do all of the steps to get that up there. But as soon as I can, I will put that up on the 
website so that there will be a direct link to this class from the website and for each class going forward. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you all for coming. Have a great night. It was really wonderful to work with you and I hope you enjoy making the July hat. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>